All right, folks, welcome to the fifth AI webinar on artificial intelligence for education. And we'll just got a couple more minutes just before we start. So if you're joining us, feel free to say where you're you are in, in the chat, make a, a comment, add some detail. Um, just to close that one off as well. So yeah, get in the chat, um, make a comment, say where you are in the world and we'll be beginning in a few minutes. I've got Dean and Tom with us here, all ready to go. So yeah, say where you are, it'd be great. I've also a little poll in there about your experience. Um, we'll sort of see how that goes, see what sort of um, experience people have um using ai tools so yeah just one more minute and then we'll we'll get started so we've got 50 percent of people using it ai two to three times a week at the moment it's a bit of a mix Do you like my um, dramatic prime <laughs> my <laughs> design? It's very dramatic, isn't it? Um, kind of up leveled from previous versions. Yeah, that's cool. I like it. A bit of mid journey on this one, and Canva as well. Canva's got some great tools, isn't it? At the moment, mm. we've seen some of those. You're kind of layering some great stuff. So, hello from Aman. So Mario. Welcome. So, you know, the first person to put something in the chat, Mario, welcome. You are very welcome. And it's great to be running another um, webinar for educators all over the place. And I was just saying to Dean and Tom how we do have quite an international kind of mix of people, even though we're all in Australia. Um, you know, we really are welcoming everybody from all over the the place and it's um which kind of reminds us about how interconnected this challenge is like we and how we as educators need to kind of be able to um, join up our thinking and have some joined up response to this and um, before we get any further um i would like just to begin with an acknowledgement of country so i am in um the traditional lands of the bunyurong people of the Kulin Nation. Um, they're the custodians of the land I'm in, and I join you from today. I recognize their continuing connection and stewardship of the lands, waters, communities, and learning. Um, I pay my respects to Indigenous elders, past, present, and those who are rising. Sovereignty here has never been ceded, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I also extend that acknowledgement to where you are from, you know, where you're joining from today. It's great that you're um, popping into the chat saying hi, um, and you know, you're joining in this conversation, which is really important. These sessions are all about coming together um, to, to be a participant in dialogue about some of this, this kind of key work and shift that we're seeing. Um, we come together to connect and to share some stories and ideas and develop our understanding together and it's just a it's a great opportunity to um to learn together so um also i've got with me um dean pierman welcome dean hi tom hello everyone and i'd like to acknowledge the country where i'm coming from too wandry and the bunurong bunurongs people as the traditional custodians of the land where i'm standing uh, and my name is Dean Pierre, and I'm the head of education at Beacon Hills College, which is a independent school in Victoria, quite a large school, two campuses, over three and a half thousand students and many, many staff. Great, Dean, you're welcome. Great to have you with us and to share some of your thinking. Tom Oliphant as well, great to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I mean, um, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm on also. I'm from um, down in South Australia in uh, Ghana land in the Adelaide Hills uh, and from St. John's Grammar, which is a small independent school um, tucked up in the hills there. Been here for, you know, my second year here, but really enjoying it. And um, also just, to, I guess, exploring some of these new technologies in a new school has been quite exciting as well. Yeah, an interesting time um, for all of us. Um, like I say, the, these, um, these sessions are all about coming together 
to engage in some dialogues. So um, for all of us, these are not so your traditional kind of stand and deliver webinars. This is an emerging space for all of us and um, we need to meet that emerging technology and the sort of shifting nature of things with space that allows that emergent thought and emerging dialogue. And so for, for Dean, Tom and myself, this is all an opportunity to learn and I want all of us here to like recognize that, see this is a chance to kind of explore things, to um, share questions. This is not about necessarily having all the answers and there's certainly plenty of things that are uncertain. Um, I can see Karen in the chat saying hi, um, welcome. And also somebody with an avatar name, Edu Ridden as well, which is great, welcome to you. Um, I'm gonna just also just share, and Victoria Hopkin, welcome Victoria Dubai. from Dubai. Um, Oman and Dubai, um, which is great. So we've got, we're hitting that kind of a different part of the world than just the Australian states. Um, just a quick reminder as I sort of set some protocols, if you're in the chat, there's also a little poll there for you just to ex sort of share how your experience AI tools, um, useful for us to get a, a sort of sense of who we're working with today. Um, and Julian, thank you. Um, you kind of clarified your name for us. I appreciate that. Jackie is here also from Brisbane. So we've got we've, we've got a running time of about an hour today. And um, we are going to, uh, we're going to be sharing the recording and resources with you all. If you're on the list, if you signed up, um, you know, you're on the list and you'll get all the, um, the slides. It may well be that we don't get through everything um, that we have in the slide deck and, but you'll, you'll get, um, all of the resources sent to you in a follow-up email. This YouTube link that you're using is is the recording, so it's, you know you don't need to kind of have something else. Um, Kim's here and Karen's here from uh, so Karen's here from North Lakes, just north of Brisbane, and Kim's from Adelaide. Welcome, welcome to you both. So um, there is no need to worry about your microphone or an awkward breakout room at the end of a end of a day. Um, <laughs> There's no need to worry about that. Just sit back and relax, and we'll do all the um, we'll do all the heavy lifting. But feel free to ask lots of questions. Um, if you have questions that you you know you want to put and throw in the mix, then please do so. We have protocols for our work as well. You see the circular diagram here. There's a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. If you're in this session, um, you know we have these expectations of each other. So first of all, we'll be hard on the content, soft on people. So ask those hard questions, but be kind to the people that are sharing those ideas. Um, we, we say we want to um, critique the work, not the person. We're going to be kind, specific, and helpful with our critique. I often you know, think about how connected those things are. And if we're not precise in our feedback, we're often not very helpful. And that generally means that we're not kind. So be precise in your questions. Be you know, um, specific in your feedback. Um, step up and step back. So a chance if you're in the audience to step up and share questions in the in the chat, um, you know, please do so. And I'm also saying this to both Dean and Tom, just to step up and share your ideas and share your practice. It's also about your um, questions that you might have, you know, share your ponderings and, you know, we can figure some of that out together. Um, and finally, just the opportunity to uh, to listen and tune into a type of listening. So this is the Chinese traditional Chinese character Ting for listening um, at the top of the diagram there, and it and it um, represents listening in a few different ways. So listen with ten eyes. The line across is one, and it's one heart. So how do we listen with purpose? Um, and then we wrap our ear around the king. And so how do we treat our speakers? Um, like royalty, you know, that's basically what we're asking for. We're, you know, we're asking to be treated like royalty. Um, it's, uh, so just a reminder for all of us just to slow down. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about is like, how do we have slow conversations when everything is moving quickly? And so just choose to give yourself permission just to slow down this afternoon and just to kind of participate in this, just to sit with these ideas at a different pace than maybe how your day has been rolling. Um, does that sound okay, Dean and Tom? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, these are always useful just to kind of establish at the beginning, just as a set of expectations for us. Um, great to see the, the, the chat flying by, a few other people, Juliana, Kathleen, 
um, is joining us as well. Campbell as well is joining us from the eastern suburbs. Has a connection with Dean, which is yeah. good. So um, we we are good to go. So I'm I'm going to kick us off here, if that's all right, um, Tom and Dean, with this question. Look, it's sort of odd to have your picture on here as you in the sidebar as well. But um, let's let's um, let's kick off with this question. So. I've been kind of posing this in every one of these webinars. And so this is the fifth time we kind of explore this. Um, so we all, all of us, all three of us have varying experience with technology in schools in different places. Um, and we've been through, there's been, there's been a lot of change and certainly across the last, you know, two to three years with COVID that has sort of, that was a force that we weren't expecting. Um, and we're also seeing the emergence of this technology in, in a different time now that is a force that we potentially weren't expecting. Help me understand your, from your point of view, um, and Dean, maybe I could come to you first. Hmm. Why, does this, why does this technology shift feel different to you? It's a good question, Tom. And I think the main reason why it feels really different is, you know, I've been part of the last you know, 25 plus years of technology in schools in the context of learning and teaching. Uh, and I think this one feels different because I was always, or I should say, we were always the author in, in the context of technology. We were creating, it didn't matter where we were in terms of the productivity tools or the authoring tools that we were using, we were creating the content to then mm design further or push further in that software. Now we're seeing that huge shift where the software is creating, or some may argue, original work, but they are actually authoring the content and we're not doing that. So I think for me, that's been the big sort of shift you're, you're seeing by using a you know, really good prompting, a computer create content where I would be doing that. So I think that's where, for me, been reflecting on that question a lot that I, I see the fact that the authoring part is now really in the hands of the machine and they're creating a lot of that and that's where that dramatic shift has been you know I mean I mean I remember when Google Docs were a thing and you could be around the world and you could see people typing I still think that's amazing and now we're seeing an actual computer create content author content mm -hmm. create imagery create video create all those things that we would do ourselves. So I think that's why I've, I'm sort of feeling it the most is because yes. of that authoring has, that authoring pendulum has really shifted um, yes. and I'm not really doing it as such. Yeah, the dynamic has really changed, hasn't it? Is mm. the kind of process of crea creation has sort of shifted in a different mm. way um, instead of just empowering us to do something faster or it's actually shifted that entirely. Mm. Um, Tom, what, what, are, what are your immediate thoughts about how yeah, this um, feels different? While, while I sort of acknowledge that, you know, some uh, schools and countries don't have access to devices and internet and things like that, but I think the accessibility to the technologies is probably the biggest thing. You know, any, everyone's got a mobile phone um, or the internet and can jump on to chat GPT very easily. The other thing is um, the barrier to entry is very low. Like you're not needing to learn a new piece of hardware or mm -hmm. a new smart board or some you know other type of software like that. Anyone can jump in and start a conversation and um, and get some outputs and some learning you know instantly and and be wowed instantly. Um, you know, my parents have used ChatGPT, and you know they were sort of once upon a time they didn't want to jump on the internet to purchase anything at all. They were scared of you know e-commerce, whereas this is Something that's come on, it's easy to access, it's easy to use, and I think that's probably the biggest difference um, for me at the moment is, uh, is yeah, the accessibility to it. Mm. Yeah, low barrier, um, but like a fundamental shift in how we participate with technology, which is interesting. Before we go any further, can you both just clarify like the situation where you are and the kind of um, whether that's to do with access or even just to give us a glimpse into, you know, where where are you as a school community regarding your your approach to AI? You know, um, just give us take us into that a little bit, so we're we're all really clear about how your school is approaching things. 
I'll, I'll go first if you might, Tom. Yeah, you go. Um, yeah. Is that all right? Um, uh, I think, look, it, when it exploded, and it was like a big bang scenario, wasn't it? It, it, it just felt like pff, it, it was hitting and rapidly and people were, uh, depending on, certainly in Australia and in Victoria where we are, where I am, is that you know, things were being banned, you can't use this. So there's a lot of noise and really happening quite frequently. And so where where I am, we, we look at you know, a fundamental principle and how we use technologies around safe, secure and ethical ways. And so we really, when ChatGBT sort of came out, we were looking certainly at what they were talking about in terms of privacy and how to use that. And just we sat a little bit um, and just considered that, let the noise sort of um, slow down. Um, we have access to our students, but we're still guided by the terms and conditions of ChatGBT around access to students, you know, 13 years and under, around parental consents and things on those mm -hmm. lines. So we're always really mindful in terms, I guess, that where I said that governance layer of how we use things. So using the terms and conditions in a safe way, um, ensuring that it meets sort of our privacy, internal privacy policies, policies and keeping our staff and students safe. Uh, and then we we haven't banned it where I am. We actually have encouraged we encourage the use of emerging technologies for cognition and thinking. And this was the same sort of scenario for us. Uh, and our normal, I guess, you know, in terms of student learning and work, our, our normal assessment policies can still capture originality. And so yeah. you know, we we certainly have encouraged students to use that and staff um, and been excited by it. Yeah, wow. And so when you, you were talking, obviously, about November, December, or at the beginning of the, this year? It was the beginning of this year, Tom, yeah, when it sort of happened. And so when when it became, I guess, readily available, that you could just jump into a browser, as Tom was saying, you know, the accessibility of it was just anywhere. And yeah. so we were seeing, obviously, seeing students quite excited by it, getting involved in it. Um, and we wanted to have a position that ensured that they were safe, our staff are safe, they under can start to understand the technology and its power, but also use it in ways that helps their thinking process. And that's what we yeah. see it as a tool. Yeah, to kind of augment thinking. Yeah, that's right. Quite, it's quite interesting. So, um, Tom, just before I come to you, just to clarify, Dean, you mentioned there about the open AI's terms of use, and it does yes. actually have that section, doesn't it, for 13 or under needs? Yes. Um, sorry, 13 or over. So between yeah, 13 yeah. and 18, they need con parental consent. consent. Yeah, yeah, it is the 13, 18 time. Yes, and you're right. And that that originally wasn't in their terms and conditions. It was um, a, it was anyone 18 years and under shouldn't have access to that. And then that was updated. So when we originally went out, um, we you know most of our students who are in the upper end year 12 would be 18, so they had access to it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't anyone else in the college because we determined our position based on obviously their terms and conditions and then when sure. they changed that and updated that to 13 to 18 we just changed our position that would allow students to engage in that with parental consent so we have our teachers mm -hmm. just going through a really simple process of getting consent from our families yeah. and then they use it within the classroom great thanks for just clarifying that i think that is important isn't it because there's mm. you know there's often you know, just kind of getting, going to the source and understanding those details, you know, make a big difference. Um, Tom, tell us a little bit about what's happening with you at St. John's. Um, so being in South Australia, obviously, we were one of the only states early on that decided not to put a, a ban or a block on um, some of the AI tools. Our education minister came out and was quite supportive and um, also the head of the, you know, the SACE as well curriculum, so it's just supportive. So... You know, we didn't have those blocks early on, so that sort of more came down to a school level. Well, what's the school's position um, on some of these AI tools? And for us, uh, there's two things. One, we wanted to sort of front run it with the teachers being well informed on these tools before it got to the students, um, so we weren't sort of playing catch up, I guess, because uh, you know, early on, not all of the students knew about the tools, so we kind of shifted a focus to, okay, let's get the teachers on board and expose them to these technologies. So when they are presented with students using AI, they know what to look for um, and how they can use it. The other thing is we sort of pulled out our academic policies and our ICT policies and we read through them. And to be honest, I, there wasn't a lot that needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of it is still relevant 
mm. whether it's an AI tool or whether it's Google or Wikipedia or whatever, access to the internet, a lot of those policies um, were still relevant with the AI. So we made some slight amendments, but generally, you know, it covered quite a lot of the AI tools anyway. So um, yeah, they sort of stayed as they are with some tweaks. And, yeah, we just sort of um, a lot of the focus then tended to be on upskilling staff so they were sort of could see it when they were presented with it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how... Um... It's interesting how it sort of stressed the systems that we have or we already have in place, but it's also important for us to recognize what's already been invested in, you know, the quality of our existing kind of structures of governance that should already be able to kind of capture these and, you know, deal with emergent sort of properties of technology. Um, and I think that's just an interesting lesson or learning from, you know, being able to kind of see how such something like this, despite it feeling like it's coming out of left field, should kind of sit, you know, well within the way that we frame or talk about digital technologies. Because it's, um, as we, as you know, some of us know more than others, but it, there's a long story here. This is not, you know, it, it may well have become in the public eye since mm -hmm. November, but actually, you know, it's been, um, if we kind of, if we go back, decade you know even back to 2015 i think google uh, kind of first sort of invented some of the technologies that are, are the foundation of this so it's longer story um and interesting just to think about how digital technologies and technologies you know how how schools respond to the emergent kind of properties of those in the future mm. um mm. i maybe i can just pop in um i think it's julian i think his name he kind of clarified earlier on um, I think it's Julian. Yes, Julian. Yeah, Julian. Yep. Um, so Julian says, um, as much as they, he agrees, our students and some of our educators are using these tools anyway, um, even if it's potentially being blocked or if it doesn't quite fit in the age group. Um, I think it, one thing I'm interested in here is that this sort of idea, somebody keeps describing it as like a whack-a-mole situation where like we're kind of like blocking this and it'll pop up elsewhere. Um, what, do you, what, what do you think about some of this, some of this, um, this mismatch or the disparity between different places blocking? You know, that's actually an equity issue, isn't it, in some mm. respects? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that we um, talked about here is that students are going to hotspot um, their devices anyway. So do we want to be presented with students getting, you know, astronomical mobile data bills because we're blocking open AI and they're just uh, going to, you know, hotspot themselves anyway. So that's why we kind of, I guess, stood back and um, didn't put those blocks on here. Um, but it is, yeah, it is an equity issue, I think, in some areas where, you know, particularly in Victoria early on, where I think you had some independent schools, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Dean, but mm. some independent schools that could make their own decision and then down the street you'd have a department school with a block. Um, yeah. you know, where's yeah. the school the equity and that sort of thing? Mm. Yeah, and I think it's the, the same concept is that students will find a way to do that anyway. Um, but I also think, yeah, the worry around it comes back to what you said before, Tom, our schools are really amazing. Uh, their internal policies and their processes are really strong. And so, and and the nuanced skills that our teachers have around their knowing their students' learning that are in front of them, you can tell what's AI and what's not still mm -hmm. as an educator. So the worry about students presenting learning that AI that is AI generated really stands out um, and our teachers that's what educators are so fabulous at is actually understanding how students learn and the work they're doing in front of them and you can yeah, still sure. recognize that you know and I think the worry about banning and it's going to you know, they'll be standing for cheating and things I think our school's internal policies and procedures can still capture that before it gets to you know a level that then the student and um, the educator has to have those conversations around authenticity and things along those lines. I think, you know, mm. let's trust our educators and trust mm. our schools um, because yeah. we do a pretty good job. Just a comment on that. Um, 
and I can I can back this up with some data, Dean, because we yeah. um, we surveyed all our staff. We sent out two bodies of text, one that was well written by a year 12 student and the other one mm. that was written by AI. Mm. And the survey went out to, you know, almost 100 staff to pick which one was AI written and which one was student written and 100% every single one picked the student one. So they could they could tell the difference between the two. And that backs mm. it up. Like you, your teachers have been teaching for a long time, you know, early career teachers or, or you know, decades. You, mm. you, Got to back in your teachers and trust them that they can um, pick the difference. And yeah, like hundred percent of the teachers got it right in that. Wow. Fascinating. One aspect I think that's interesting for me, because oh, I was in I was in the classroom when you, the kind of YouTube sort of technology started to have an influence, and people were blocking and banning, you know, um, <laughs> that. You. And you know, I think it's fascinating to both for two different reasons one is the kind of longer story here which is like when you zoom out you see that long trajectory um you know which is now become something that's really a powerful learning tool um and the other is just that it's um it's just so interesting to sort of see you know students having um access as soon as they cross a threshold you know back into life you know and so how that felt so wrong and so false that they kind of had this version of their existence that didn't have access to these powerful tools and technologies. And I just think there's, you know, something really powerful to think about how schools are places where we can deal with this emergence. Like we, we mm. should be able to, you know, these are places that are set up in our, in our lives that allow us to explore and be curious and to wonder and to mm. figure things out together. You know, and schools should be places where we actually have a really strong voice around how these technologies influence us as a society. So when you take that away mm. as a capability, I think that that's something that's really lost. Mm. All right. Um, I'm going to move us on. So one of the things that we do in these sessions is also to talk about, um, you know, some building blocks. And so um, I... You know, I think it's really important not just to assume that everybody understands, you know, these technologies. And we, I always try to build in something in these sessions where we talk about just some foundational elements of what's going on. When I look at the little poll that we've been doing, you know, about 45 percent of people, so nearly half of the people tonight with us um, have been using AI. So two to three times a week off and on in different kind of aspects. So it's important that we all just keep investing in our AI literacy. And so let me just sort of take you through a couple of frameworks that make sense. And Dean when, and Tom, when I get to some of the questions in the next slide, I'd be kind of keen to kind of hear what you think is really important or, you know, what sort of resonates with you. So one framework when you're approaching this with your staff or with your colleagues, or even if, you know, you're planning professional learning, is just to think about these four different aspects. So what are the tools that we have access to, um, the skill set that um, is relevant, how you know how we build knowledge and obviously mindset i often talk about these four um, when i'm thinking about designing learning um, let me just show you some of these questions then that are relevant to ai and um, yeah tell tell me dean and tom what what resonates so the idea of um, what tools methods and technologies are relevant and accessible to students and teachers not just ai tools and so how for example dean you mentioned about thinking routines or how thinking mm -hmm. kind of tools that we have can be augmented um, i'm curious to kind of think about the skills that are either existing emerging or brand new that i need to fulfill the potential of ai technology i think there's I think we have to kind of pay attention to the existing skills that we have, not just think about these are all new and what knowledge and understanding kind of plays a role. And probably the stuff that's harder to pin down is other dispositions that will make a difference. So what are the mindsets? Anything here kind of jump out to you both? I'd be keen to kind of get your thoughts. Yeah, for me, I yeah, mean, that's um, skills thing. Go, Tom. <laughs> no, you go, mate. You go. Uh, sorry, sorry, I jumped in. Um, I think that skills thing is a really interesting one. And so existing, emerging, and new, are there any existing, emerging, and new skills in terms of the use of AI? Because well, I, yeah, yeah. I, I do I think know. there are because there's communication skills, right? Yeah. 
So yeah. there are certain kind of a bit of capabilities in terms of like the written text. I think that's a bit of a, you know, there's an emphasis at the minute on written text to participate and work with AI. So there is some skill that you're leaning on there. Mm. Yeah, is that, I think is um, that a new skill. Well, I think it's a shift. Maybe it's a sort of shift, but I do think that you're relying upon certain. I think literacy capabilities and skills mm. within communication, you mm. know, are a precursor to effective, you know, work with these things. And I, mm. I do worry about that actually as a potential block for some students to kind of mm. access. Tom, what were you going to say? Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, if we look at how AI works, um, it's obviously data in, you've got your algorithm and then you've got your prediction or your, your data out. So, I mean, I think you've got your digital literacy. I think data literacy is going to be something that is going to be quite important moving forward to really understand how these large language models work and how machine learning works is, you know, really getting a deep understanding of data mm -hmm. analysis and how data works and how that influences outcomes. I think that is a, a skill to be important. And then algorithmic thinking. So, you know, that's similar to your computational thinking, but... You know, those sort of thinking skills. So I guess a shift in focus maybe to a deeper understanding of some of the skills that are more closely associated with AI because then that will help people understand a little bit deeper things like ethics and, and so forth, like what are the reasons that we're getting these sort of outputs from AI. If you understand a little bit more what goes into creating those outputs in the first place, I think that will help you know, users of AI get a better understanding of it to modify their inputs, but get a deeper understanding of some of the outputs as well. Dean, what do you well, think? I'm curious around that because I think it kind of feels the same. Remember when, you know, coding and everyone should learn coding in schools. Everyone needs to know how coding works. They've got to have this computational thinking, you know, when STEM and all that sort of stuff was, you know, kind of driving in schools. Yeah, I'd say we not all students know how to code. Not all students need have an understanding of that. Will that will that matter? Is my wondering, because mm. I do agree with Tom as well. I think having that deep understanding supports your thinking on how it works. But are we in that sort of same boat when you know saying that all students need to know how it works? Um, and it kind of feels a little bit the same, like that sort of coding revolution around yeah. all students need to know how to code, what the, how the structures are. I mean, we haven't done that. And that has that impacted their direction, their use of it? I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, and when I look at new, I think 10 years from now, you know, I'm not yeah. thinking new, new as in next week. Like if we're thinking, you know, if AI keeps going the way it's going and the predictions are right in terms of AI mm. becoming AI tutors and so forth and things like that, and we fast forward, 10 plus years down the track, um, those skills become quite important. And yeah. I think going back to the the coding one, that was, uh, I guess, in most schools tended to be quite a specialist skill that mm. was maybe taught within digital technologies, yeah. maybe science or maths. But these are skills that I see as necessary across all curriculum areas, um, not just digital technologies. So, mm -hmm. you, know, if, you know, if you're English and your humanities and things like that also understand these skills that can really influence um, the way that they work and interact with AI, I believe. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting how this will sort of track forwards, isn't it? I think the, the technology that we're experiencing is the worst kind of at the moment, it's going to get better, right? So yeah. it's going to improve. And so, you know, it, and I think I, I'm certainly aware outside of education of a lot of no code um, tools that enable entrepreneurs and people running new businesses to kind of create without having to code. And so, um, and obviously there's lots of technology that is powered by AI that will enable that. And we're seeing lots of those types of examples with chat GPT. I'm going to move us on to talk a little bit about creativity. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to everybody who's making comments and adding questions into the chat. Keep that coming so my question my next question for you both is to think about how ai might change creativity i was really careful about how i worded this um not that it can not that it is doing already but it it might change 
creativity in our schools. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Dean. What was your initial kind of thoughts about this question? Uh, I, for me, I, I think just getting a clarity around what we're talking about in terms of creativity. So we're talking about, you know, multitude of different ideas, different ways of approaching a problem, a concept, et cetera, in terms of creativity. Uh, mm. And so I've sort of framed that, my answer in that sort of context. I think, I think it will support students through a process of coming up with maybe more ideas, more ways okay. of trying to solve it. But my wondering is about, you know, and I think we were talking about this in the green room before, is that you know, we the fundamental principle for me still applies that you need to have knowledge about the steep knowledge about the subject matter in which you are learning in order to understand which idea works or doesn't work. So you know, I'm a design teacher, for instance, uh, and so communication design, and that's my background is in fine and visual arts. And so, yeah, I, I wonder about... You, you know, for me to be a really successful photographer, I need to have the fundamental principles of composition, layout, aesthetic, all, you know, all the stuff that makes a work successful. If I'm just using an AI tool without that knowledge, how will I know what works and what doesn't? So I, I guess that's where I'm really interested in, how this will impact creativity in schools. I think it'll, you know, I mean, I use AI daily to come up with, you know, a, a blank piece of paper when I'm writing, thinking about something, chuck it in there to get something and scaffold and build. Yeah. But I wonder whether our students have the skill and the knowledge that I've acquired over many years of learning and thinking about this to actually take mm -hmm. it to the next level. So I think that's sort of where I've been sitting in this. How will it change creativity in schools? I think it will change the way in maybe the importance of knowledge, which is still a fundamental thing and that, that, that skill that needs to then be able to critically appraise what the outputs are, yeah. I think that's where that maybe that focus will come into. Maybe we'll value that fundamental learning of the analog that's really, really important to understand the digital. Uh, maybe that's where it will go with me. Um, but without a doubt, it'll, it will support students to really think, you know, not start anything on a blank canvas. Yeah. Can you just, can, can you just give us a concrete like tool or thing that you're using or you're seeing your students use at that oh, point? Me, like... it, it really is chat GBT in terms of a, a lot of that type of work at the moment. I've been exploring that you know, deeply in terms of, um, you know, inputting uh, student content, my own content, analyzing yeah. it, referencing it, um, mm -hmm. stripping it back, looking for key themes, you know, creating yeah. prompts. Uh, exploring how it could write uh, units of work, you know, all of that type of thing. With that's mm. where I've been sort of living in um, that type of world. Um, so yeah, ChatGPT has been the main one I've explored. I haven't, you know, I know about all, you know, Midjourney, all the other um, parts, but haven't really gone deep into that space yet. Yeah, just interesting though to think about how you know there's going to be greater stress or greater emphasis on discernment and you know. Um, choice and you know that kind of convergent side mm -hmm. of you know the process where the divergent side is going to be powered up with these tools so we can mm -hmm. get to lots of ideas quicker mm -hmm. and that's going to help so many people who often stall at those early stages like there's more yeah. access to that but then it's going to put more emphasis there and if you've got more ideas it's, it's it stresses the skill of being able to say as you describe it to mm -hmm. have the knowledge and understanding to know what it will make the biggest difference yeah. to pick out from 30 things mm. like the one that is worth taking forwards mm. and that has the most potential so it's interesting how the sort of technology is at the start of the process sort of powering up divergent mm. thinking but it's going to stress the kind of process later on if we take that as a human capability only mm. you know interesting I kind of can I like I kind of think about it in that sense of you know when all the streaming services. If you look at all the streaming services we have, there's so much content on there we never watch anything because there's so much choice. And I worry about how is that the kind of concept that will happen in schools that you know the outputs will be just so dramatic that students won't be able to take one and grapple with it and go 
um, and know and know what's working and what's not. I think that still will be some of those big things. More choice doesn't necessarily mean better um, outcomes in the end. So I kind of think I'm I'm in this very cautious, you know, sort of space about the you know what impact it will have on creativity in schools. Mm, fascinating. Thank you, Tom. What about you? Yeah, I've got um two way. I'm going to respond to this with two things. One is um, going back to, you know, let's, they treat our students kind of like AI themselves. So, you know, they've got the data in, they've got their brain, and then they've got the output, whatever it is that they create for this summative task. So we coming from a design and technology background. Um, one of the, and one of the Australian curriculum asked students to do is to look at existing products on the market and analyse those. So what you end up seeing is students go to Google or wherever and pick three or four of the first 20 products that show up on Google Images, okay? And you end up with all these students, so that data's going in, and I think they're capping themselves in terms of the creativity of what they can come up with because they've got a limited source of existing products and their design um, outputs are, you know, kind of constrained by what they've seen. If you can use some artificial intelligence tools with image generation um, with some prompts and whatnot, you're getting these really, really creative left field ideas. That's new, fresh, creative data input that goes to the student's brain and then hopefully influences the output when they get to those design or creative stages. Um, the other thing is, and this is what I'm kind of doing here to boost creativity, is um, a lot of assessment tasks are focused on the end product. The end product is what everyone freaks out about at the moment with AI is that you know, how are we going to be able to assess this end product? So what if we make the end product a formative piece of assessment and that whole process leading up, the creative process, the summative piece of assessment, and, you know, if you want to use AI, you want to do this, this, but making that the emphasis, like the whole creative process, the, the summative assessment part, and the output, if the output's done with AI, like, I don't even care because that's formative, but everything that led up to that point and all the creativity and the investigation and how you're prompted and all of those sort of things got you to that point. If you use AI for the output, that's fine. But, you know, that's a formative. I'm, I want to know all this stuff that comes before that. So that's sort of how I've flipped my assessment here is mm. more of an emphasis on the, on the process, less of an emphasis on the end product. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if I say it's Tom, the challenge you and I, Tom, in our subjects which are creative and are process-based, it's quite, you know, maybe it's an easy shift, but I wonder how you go into different subjects, domains, learning domains, how that would work when it's not as process-based, project-based, because I think you and I, I, the use of AI tools lends itself quite nicely to our spaces. So that's an, another thing that, you know, would, I'd be curious about. Yeah, I mean, I did this project with English. Um, we created a, a children's book. Mm. Um, used with a big emphasis on that creative process and got mm. AI to do all the book creation. Yeah, um, wonderful. And what we did is we took it to some uh, junior school students, got them to read the book to them and got some feedback, and then we gave it to our Year 12 students, got them to do a critical analysis of it. And then the students got all of that data and the assessment was a presentation on the, on the feedback and how good AI was in creating mm. that. So... English have been running with that idea. I think it's just uh, yeah, just changing the mindset. It goes back to the yeah. slide before where it kind of talks about, I can't remember, the, the bottom left-hand question. I can't yeah, remember what it was. But, but my, the first thing that popped up to me was just being open-minded. You know, yeah, that's probably one absolutely. of the big things with AI is just being open-minded mm. um, to what's possible. And I think if if you can be that, then it's that's sort of what opens up some of the opportunities. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Absolutely. One of the things I'm noticing is um, people like Professor Ethan Mollick, who's leading lots of some, you know, lots of the emerging practice around this at the higher education level anyway, talking about um, a shift in expectations of his students. And so imagine every student is powered and augmented their, augment, augment their capabilities with AI assistance. Then in, there should this there should naturally be a, an increasing level of expectation of what they can create and you know express and how they demonstrate their learning in new ways. And he was, I think, 
you know, I don't remember it exactly, but roughly speaking, kind of taking a, a term's worth of work and doing it in two sessions, mm. you know, and that's really interesting to think about mm. how, you know, this really shifts what we're capable of doing. Um, you know, um, can I just shift our kind of chat from mm. creativity in, for, for our students to teacher specific? And maybe I can pick up on what Wanda shared, uh, who is a primary school principal yeah. joining us. She's saying that she's super excited about what AI is going to do um, for you know her teachers. Workload reduction possibilities are endless. Um, can you just maybe make a comment, um, you two, about how you're seeing the potential, in, you know, for for teacher workload, for for teacher creativity. Um, as much as anything, it's not just about our students' creativity being powered up by these new mm. tools. Um, Dean, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I think to, until, you know, I'm, I mean, we're a Microsoft school and until, you know, Copilot sits into productivity tools, I think that's when we'll really see the impact um, okay. and some of that work that's happening. I think at the moment, you're still going to another space and inputting from different parts. But when it's right there, you know, and kind of the AI that we've had on our phones for so long, it's right there, it's in the app, it's, it meets you where you're at. So mm. I think once it hits into those spaces and some of the things that that will do, it will exponentially take, you know, as one was talking about, some of those workload issues that teachers are facing, um, their ability to be in the place with data and manipulate that and summarize and things on those lines i can see it. that's when the value will really hit i think that's when it's going to become really quite interesting and so you know, at the moment with you can explore the writing of units in chat gbt um, and you know getting um, themes out of student work you know in terms of you know, a teacher's workload you can um, have it create you know learning intentions and success criteria you can um, have it write a unit of work for you. Uh, you know, so there's all that now happening, which is, you know, just, again, it's that sort of concept. You're not staring at a blank canvas. Mm. You're getting a scaffold and then you can build from that. Um, you know, I was using it the other day where I was doing a, a bit of a workshop with um, my teams here and they've inputted all this data. I grabbed that data, placed it into ChatGBT, asked it to pull out the key themes, pull out the key questions that the data asks, and then, you know, going back to the team. So, I mean... There, and I would have done that obviously manually, read, thought about that. And so mm. I think there's all, there's so many, it's kind of what Tom said before, open your mind and you'll find different uses for your work uh, and what you do in terms of um, being an educator. So, but for me, I'm, I'm waiting for it to be right in front of us. And then yeah. that's when I think the hit will then just say, wow, this will be quite an amazing tool. Can you just kind of clarify when you refer to Microsoft Copilot, what, what yes. do you mean? Well, I think Microsoft Copilot is their sort of in, inbuilt chat GPT, you know, three, four type of scenario that's in all their productivity tools. So if you're in Microsoft 365 across the, that ecosystem, Copilot is their inbuilt, not, well, not theirs, but their AI models that will yeah. uh, building upon all the generative AI that's out there. So it's going to draw from like data from different places and yeah. can do multiple step kind of problems and that type of stuff kind of. Yeah, it can. And it can, so it reads your doc. So you can see that you can, you know, for instance, if you're, you know, a practical concrete example, um, from what I understand is that you could be in one note doing meeting notes and then AI can simplify that, spit that back out to you, create a presentation, create a project plan, a board report, you know, all those different things just from, what's on those pages. So sort of you know, bringing everything together to create content from what yeah. you input into it. So, and I think that's the exciting part. That'll be the really interesting part. Yes. And so those capabilities are just around the corner. And I think, you know, we, today we saw Google Bard being released, or I think it was mm. yesterday. And so we're going to see this sort of similar moves from the Google kind of workspace environment yep. too, where these technologies will be literally at your cursor. So mm. I often describe it as like inline AI is like literally where you yeah. are and you can kind of do a backslash and be kind of working, you know, with a, with that technology. Um, and Tom, tell us a little bit about how you're seeing the kind of effect of these technologies on teacher, teacher creativity or workload. Yeah. I mean, I think workload, um, 
I've sort of said this to a few teachers, like a lot sort of come in and expect it to give you, you know, get rid of half a day's work. But I sort of say, even if you get 10 minutes a day, it helps you out. You basically free yourself up one lesson a week. You know, like it does, it's just those few little things that can help you out. So for me, the main things have been like a lot of the administrative stuff, you know, like um, risk assessments or, mm. uh, you know, you need to craft a letter to WHS committee or any of this sort of stuff. Uh, grant applications, brilliant. Uh, but the uh, big one for me is differentiation with assessment tasks for students with, you know, learning needs and things like that. So I can put it in and say, can you modify this task for a student operating at a year seven level with, you know, low level literacy skills? And it will generate that for me. Or, you know, this student has um, ASD, they're, you know, but they're really highly motivated by Minecraft. Can you modify this task? Um, so it's a little bit more focused on Minecraft to keep this student engaged. And things like that have been awesome. You know, like that's probably one of the biggest things I think for teachers is differentiating tasks for students mm. with learning needs. And you might have three or four in a class. You know, where do you find the time for that? And I know that mm. in staff meetings that quite often comes up as where's the time going to be given to us so we can do this differentiation? Um, and I've found that these AI tools are an excellent starting point. And I've run this stuff past um, our learning support team and they were blown away. They, they thought it um, stacked up pretty well. So yeah, that is one area worth exploring. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, key, I think key to all of this is that there's a human in the loop, as you would say, mm -hmm. you know, like we, we are going to the expertise that exists within our school, you know, to, to verify and to be discerning and to kind of share that, um, you know, we're saving time, but we've also got to check for accuracy and precision and appropriateness within our context, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, but there's some, you know, potentially huge savings in terms of time. It's what we do with that time that then counts, isn't it? It's like how you then, you know, what you then do with that, how you, mm -hmm. you know, you focus on the things that will make the biggest difference to our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you saw um, Sam Altman's latest claim. He's uh, the guy that obviously created OpenAI, but he said once um, AGI gets here, in terms of workload reduction, it'd be generating about thirteen thousand dollars a year for each resident of the US. In hmm. terms of what that will be able to generate, the time it will save, and all that sort of stuff. But I thought that was a, probably a bit of a hot take, but it's an interesting comment. Mm. Yeah. It'd be amazing to see maybe how our industry, um, the kind of positive flow into education of like s the savings, and also you know in terms of time, but also just mental health, mm. you know the gain, you know the the reduction in um, the challenges that we all potentially face with this, with the work that we do and the intensity of those things. Um, yep. There's there is great potential there. Um, be interesting to see what actually occurs and what those real differences are, you know, but I, but I'm, we're starting to see more of that, you know, colleagues saying I had two days blocked out to do something and it's taken me a few hours and that's like a massive difference, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, we've, we've got like 10 more minutes together and I just want to, um, pick out a couple of just again, foundational pieces, and then I'm going to come to Tom and Dean just to share maybe a kind of key idea they want to they want to leave us with or a key lesson that they've learned. But I'm also keen from those of you that are still with us, if you've got questions, now's a really good time just to throw them in and we'll see if we can get to those as well before we wrap up in about 10 more minutes. Um, so one of the things that we, like I said, we talk, we try to weave into this work is just the these building blocks. So not to assume that we all know what these things are and this is a this is this slide has been around for a, a while as we try to kind of look at what is it that we're actually talking about and it does how does it um help us to know a little bit more one thing about chat gpt um which has been you know is now one of a few different technologies that we can access um it is a chat bot so it sits in that kind of space where it's conversational and so your ability to stay in conversation with these technologies to go back and forth to adapt to you know change this change that I like this I don't like that and to stay in and kind of iterative cycle of improvement of the things that you create together 
is really important. It's not a, as somebody described, you know, don't use these tools as vending machines. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just punch it and then get something out. Like you gotta stay with it. Um, so the GPT part is the, the technology that sort of sits behind this really. The, it's a generative pre-trained transformer. So um, the transformer part is the, the Google invention from 2015. It's got data that's already been trained. So it's kind of static. It's not going to change. And you might recall that some of it, you know, it reaches a certain point like 2021 or something and it kind of has a cutoff for data. Um, the generative part you've probably seen floating around, and that's useful to know too, is it's about its ability to um, to take text in and to create, you know, quite a broad range of text going out. It's not just being able to identify, you know, like a, um, a panda when it walks across a camera screen and says, there's a panda. And its only job in the world is to recognize when a panda walks across a wildlife camera kind of lens. So those are like narrow technologies or narrow AI, where we're talking about generative, it has much more capability, it's much broader. Um, and these, these are useful kind of reminders as well about these acronyms, you see them floating around. We talked about GPT. Um, the LLM stuff, that's the kind of model that it's been trained on. Um, and, you know, so if you see BARD or um, chat GPT, there's these large language models that are powering them, that, you know, behind the scenes. It's like the engine behind the scenes. Um, natural language processing is also something to do with the prompting that we do. So we can say, we can ask these technologies to do things in a very natural way. Um, and it kind of makes sense of that. And that's a key capability. And we've always, already talked about machine learning. Um, when it comes to prompting, that's the your written instructions that you kind of put into these um, these tools. And that kind of brings me then to just maybe we can talk about this as sort of the final part, um, Tom and Dean, is just a, is there something that you, you would what you would recommend or share, you know, in terms of a resource or a prompt that you found most helpful? Tom, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. Um, what I have found quite useful is the Google Teachable Machine. I don't know if anyone's ever used that before, but um, the Teachable Machine just teaches you. Uh, it's great for students, and uh, but it teaches you all about how AI and machine learning works, and it gets you to input some images, and it's got, you know, you kind of create the algorithm a bit about what you want to do with those images, and then you can actually test out um this ai machine so that i found was quite useful in teaching students the basics about how all of this stuff works it's not this just magic that um that happens and then uh sort of moving from there into using uh some of the ai tools i'm still you know old school almost in ai that i still love open um open ai's chat gpt that's sort of my go-to but there's lots of tools out there but i think that's a, an awesome place um not too scary it's nice and simple uh, and easy to use it's a great place to start um, and it's incredibly useful so they're probably my two um to go to so thanks great um tom just picking up on the point about kind of going to chat with gpt and just working with that as a core technology like we're seeing hundreds if not thousands of these new tools popping up like people using and creating very specific tools but now, going back to ChatGPT and just spending time in that space, like working with it, it's still very, very powerful, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you said, there's thousands of these tools out there. It just makes me question a little bit more around that cyber safety issue with students clicking on all of these other new AI tools. Like what's really happening behind those clicks? You know, like it'd be a mm. perfect space for, for scams and stuff like that. So mm. yeah, kind of bringing it back to just some really core safe tools that, um, you know, that work. Right. Mm. Thank you for your recommendation. Dean, do you want to keep going? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Tom. I've, I've sort of gone only deep in the chat GBT. Like I know about the other things in terms of, what I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of work on prompting, so understanding a fundamental, you know, I guess a prompt like a question, um, and I've just been playing with ChatGPT over that sort of time, having a conversation and, you know, pushing it to, you know, the different parts of the different way I ask things and see what happens, putting in things. Um, I was getting some really curious things. I was asking it yesterday and it 
drew me back to COVID, which was totally unrelated, which is quite funny. Um, and I don't know, I was actually asking it about synthesizing some assessment questions and it, and it gave me an answer around COVID, which was really interesting. So I've been playing around with that. Um, but there's been, I think like all of us and, and to Tom's point too, there's so much stuff out there, um, thousands of things happening and the noise was really quite large at the start like if we talk of a few months ago and i just i just stopped and just didn't engage um for a while just to so i could i you know distilled a little bit i slowed down and now i'm sort of you know as we're doing now tom like listening to people i trust and know in this space um people like yourself you know steve brophy and others around those lines listening to you know the valued opinions of colleagues and people I know that have been working in this space for a long time of sort of where I'm going to. So, yeah. uh, and having conversations and it might be the great hair. I'm getting older and just more patient with this stuff and not running into it, just seeing yeah. what happens, learning about it, having a bit of a play with myself, you know, by myself, thinking about the context of it um, around there uh, is kind of what I've been doing with it. Yeah. Yeah. My other comment would be, um, for those schools, like we initially had a situation where we very early on couldn't use OpenAI due to the age restrictions. Mm. So we jumped in and used um, U.com chat and Stable Diffusion. So they're the image generation tool, text generation tool that require no logins and they're web browser yeah. based um, is also a nice way to get started and not have to have students sign up or anything like that. Um, not as good as uh, OpenAI and, you know, mid-journey in my opinion, but still very good to to give a go. And you, you're not restricted by having to get classes signed up and, you know, those privacy con um, concerns that some schools might have as well. So. Mm. Yeah, there's perplexity AI as well, which has been a, yeah. another kind of useful search engine chat tool, mm. kind of hybrid. So, again, no login. Um, I'm I'm actually quite curious to see how the the kind of the world of search and research, you know, mm. research will sort of shift when we think about mm. that. Um, you know, that role within schools and within the creative process, and how you know what it means to kind of be googling things anymore, and how do we kind of access you know accurate information? So mm. it's certainly going to change. Um, so let me finish up, um, you know, and first just thank Dean and Tom for joining us. It's been fantastic to spend a bit of time with you both, um, just exploring these ideas. It's a pretty fluid and emerging space, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm really grateful to you both for, for joining us this evening just to explore it. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And I want to do a little, little shout out to your um, your weekly newsletter yeah, as well. Absolutely. It's been an app, absolutely. If anyone um, wants to save themselves some time, sign up to Tom's uh, <laughs> newsletter because that's been an absolute time saver. Getting that on Mondays, filtering through all the noise, um, that's been very good. Oh, mm. thanks. That's Tom. great. That's good. Nice to get a bit of feedback from a mm. from a reader. <laughs> yeah. So we try. I try to. Kind of say like these are some key stories from the week and we've got you know a bit of a few ideas around prompting and things which is like a, a kind of maybe a key um area to focus in on i just encourage people just to keep practicing and trying and just exploring you know like mm -hmm. dean described you know trying in different ways exploring it um how it might affect you know your workflow um, but also maybe identifying places in your workflow, in your productivity kind of flow, that there are bottlenecks, there are places where it can improve, not just to use it for its sake, but maybe identify mm. places where it's going to add some value. Yeah, cool. um, I think it's really interesting. Mm. Um, so this was the fifth kind of dialogue session. We've got a, a whole range of educators planned from across um, the globe. I actually ha can actually say that now. So I've got people coming and joining us in a couple of weeks' time. So um, I'll, you know, I'll be sending out details about the future sessions if you're interested in joining. Um, Dean and Tom, once again, a big thank you to you both, and thank you to everybody um, for joining no. us, joining us online and sharing um, your comments and your questions and supporting us. It's great. Um, just to remind you, I'll be sending an email just with all the resources, so the slides. Um, from today and also just a reminder about the link for 
um, the recording of this, which is just what you've been using in terms of the YouTube live stream. So it's just the same. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it'd be great to stay in touch and maybe we'll see you in a future session. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. See you, mate. See you. Cheers. Bye. Yeah.